the work of the Hurricane Center and your work as well over the years has focused so much on the storm surge portion of the storm. Now, my city, Houston, Galveston, we're flat as a pancake. We're covered in bayous. Now, these bayous can hold a tremendous amount of water, but when a surge comes in, it creates all kinds of unique drainage hazards. Can you tell me about how your work maybe has focused on what could happen in Houston and Galveston? Yeah, so Houston is especially vulnerable. It's probably one of the areas I'm worried about most, and the residents there haven't seen the worst case scenario. To mentally uh, sort of think about the worst case scenario, imagine all of the rain in, in Harvey uh, with the, the historic storm surges that you've seen from past uh, storms. Uh, many people have, have seen these big storm surge uh, events. So what happens is all that rain tries to flow you know, into the ocean uh, through the bayous and rivers and, and such. And the storm surge is trying to come up those same waterways and they collide. Um, and whenever those two collide, it's, it, it basically magnifies the flooding. So I, I don't think we've seen the worst in Houston, as hard as that is to believe. Um, and so I really worry the residents are using too much of these historical storms to base their um, sort of mental model of a hurricane. Our, our normalcy bias is gonna be really tough to overcome. And to your point, what I preach is you can't go on what happened with the last storm to predict what's gonna happen with the next storm. Yeah, so in, especially with water, especially with water. So each, each hurricane is gonna have a totally different flood footprint. Um, whether a individual home was wet or dry in a past hurricane, doesn't tell you a whole lot about the, whether that home will be wet or dry in, in the next hurricane. Some hurricanes are, are quick, fast. They move through an area quickly. Um, some, like Harvey, are slow. You know, they sit basically still. And um, you know, every hurricane is like a human. It's just a little bit different. So what is exciting about what you guys are doing at the NHC is your, your advances in modeling and forecasting this, this surge. Tell me about what's going on at the Hurricane Center and what new modeling you have that can help moving forward. Yeah, so we're, we're always advancing the modeling every year, especially on storm surge. There's been this rapid uh, research and development uh, thrust as we, as we try to move people from the traditional method of the Saffir-Simpson scale and the cone. Um, very clear communication mechanisms because they're simple, but their simplicity is the problem. It's not allowing us to convey the nuances of these hurricanes that you and I just talked about. We said that hurricanes are like people, and, and so you know, compartmentalizing them into one through five um, isn't allowing us to convey um, these, these nuances, especially, especially the flood nuances. So tell me about what we can expect with the modeling and how the changes have come rapidly. This has happened in just the last couple of years where the modeling, from my understanding, now we're gonna get one or two days of, of lead time of looking at what the surge might look like in my community. Yeah, so it used to be because we were unable to, to model the details, and especially with long lead times, meaning two, three days before landfall, we, we produced these very generic uh, risk statements, or basically like the entire Texas coast, mm -hmm. which you and I know is, is not a, you know, realistic communication. But now as we're getting better and better in our ability to define which areas of the Texas coast and which communities within that segment of the Texas coast are is gonna be most vulnerable, and we're extending the lead times, um, and the greatest example of this um, was a recent storm, Laura. I can remember the day, and it wasn't that long ago, where that storm would have caused mass evacuation of the Houston-Galveston area. I mean, hundreds of thousands, if not a couple of million people with all the new population uh, that's been added to the area. And yet, the evacuation was relatively strategic and contained. Um, and this is, this is a big win for the science and the emergency management community because evacuations themselves 
can be deadly. We lost over 100 people, 105, I think, in the evacuation from Rita alone. Mm -hmm. Just the evacuation. Oh, tragic. Just the evacuation. So the ability to, to limit the evacuation and, and surgically do it um, is making the community safer. I think being able to paint a picture neighborhood by neighborhood, community by community, with, with modeling to say, okay, here's how much water is potentially going to be in your home. You know, it helps those individual communities make that decision and helps others know that they can stay put. Yeah. And I mean, and, and for a historical context, that lower case, that lower case of refining and restricting the evacuation area was probably one of the early demonstrations of the new modeling and the new science. So, so everybody was decidedly you know, white knuckled you know, as, as we marched that one up the coast, but it was a tremendous uh, success story for the upper Texas coast. And you realize what giving emergency managers two or three days lead time, you realize the difference that can make. Yeah, it, it, it makes a difference in ways that people may not see at the surface. If we ask you to evacuate and you're stuck in a miserable traffic situation, kids, cars, dogs in the car for 10 hours, can't find a hotel, you know, and, and then the weather doesn't come through your community, there's a high probability that you won't evacuate next time. So stopping these unnecessary evacuations um, actually ends up saving people not, on that, not only on that particular storm, it saves them on the next storm too because we get a higher rate of compliance on evacuation orders. If I remember correctly, Laura had a very tight, compact wind field. Tell me what you're seeing. Is there a trend? I've just noticed several hurricanes in the last couple of years, last decade, seem to be a little bit more compact. Is this a trend or is it just something we're seeing right now in hurricane structure? It's, it's too early to know if it's a trend. I know what you're talking about because we see it too. So it could be the fact that we're getting stronger storms. So stronger storms by the very nature have to be compact. It's just like a figure skater. You know, they pull their arms in at the end of the, to, to go faster. Same as with the hurricanes. They have to be small to be intense. And we've had a lot of really intense storms making landfall of late. And that might be what is, is causing the size difference. Um, you know, it takes decades to really understand if a true trend is happening because hurricanes are a relatively rare phenomenon. I know, I know people in Houston are gonna say, what's he talking about? Yeah. Yeah. But hurricanes don't occur enough to provide us um, a, a rich data set. So we, we t typically need you know, 20, 30 years to determine if there's a trend. That, to your point, if I remember correctly, so the last big hurricane that hit Houston, Ike in 08, was a compact Cat 4 in the Caribbean and then clipped the western tip of Cuba. The interaction with land that you bring up, and at that moment, it spread out. Yep. It's wind field weakened, but it became very broad. And you mentioned earlier about the Saffir Simpson scale. Was that the one? That, was, a, that was the one that broke the camel's back. Yeah. That Tell was me the about one that, that um, because when I looked back um, in Houston native, Bill Reed was the, you know, the director at the time. And so when he and I looked back at the storm surge forecast was like massive. It was like 15 to 20 feet and people didn't evacuate the Bolivar Peninsula. And, and in my mind, I could, how could any reasonable person hear a 15 to 20 foot storm surge forecast and not evacuate a barrier island? I mean, I was just floored by that. But I think what we saw is people were hung up on this Saffir Simpson scale. It was only a cat too. And not only that, there was the, the implication that it had gone down. Mm -hmm. You go from a four to a two, most people look at that and say, well, two is half of four. This thing has lost half its power. Um, and that's when we knew we had to remove any mention of the storm surge out of the Saffir Simpson scale and then develop dedicated storm surge uh, you know, communication mechanisms. If we were to march forward with the Ike framework in Laura, I assure you much of the Houston Galveston area would have been evacuated during Laura. Laura. Inland flooding caused by heavy rainfall. There are some possible trends pointing toward these hurricanes carrying more moisture with them and dumping heavier rain event. We certainly saw that with Harvey. It may have been just a factor of its slow or lack of any type of forward movement. But tell me what we're seeing with that and what type of modeling improvements are you guys at the Hurricane Center working with to help us forecast the inland flooding threat? So you, you don't have to be an expert to figure this one out. It's more humid and muggy in the summer. 
right, miserable in Texas, because a warm atmosphere holds more moisture. So it stands the reason if the, if the globe is getting warmer, and it is, it's going to hold more moisture. And when a hurricane comes along, it's like taking your hands and squeezing a sponge full of water. It just wrings all of that water out. And so we are absolutely seeing a trend towards storms producing more rain and more flooding. Um, that appears to be a, a relatively solid trend um, that's in all likelihood gonna get worse as time marches on. At the same time, we're also seeing a trend towards greater mortality or deaths from this inland flooding component. It used to be the storm surge was the greatest cause of direct fatality. Now it's rain and freshwater flooding if you look at the last 10 years. Um, and so we're switching our messaging to try to like help people understand that inland threat and that, that need to take action if you're under a, a, a flood risk. I wonder if that's also a function of, so in Houston, Harris County, we're building, we're building, and we're, we're pushing the boundaries right up to, you know, we use a 100-year floodplain as kind of a benchmark, right. and, and we, we push it. because We want to live next to those creeks and bayous because they're, they're pretty and there's land there, but that may also be a factor in the increased number of homes and, and perhaps fatalities in inland flooding. Yeah, so there's two factors that happens with urbanization. It, typically, people will push the threshold and, and move into areas that past generations may have avoided because of flood risk. So that happens. Also, when you turn something into concrete, roads, asphalt, um, that, that doesn't absorb water. Okay, so the water just runs off of that. So those two things combined um, make our, our urban cities especially vulnerable to this heavy rainfall threat. And in your case, in Houston, you've got the added threat of the surge Mm -hmm. is still there. So my message to, to people in Houston, Galveston is, is no matter what storms you've gone through, you know, I, I don't want to hear you say, oh, I've gone through this many storms, I know. Um, no matter how many storms you've gone through, the next one is going to be unique and different and you better be prepared.